Hey folks, Joseph Sabora here. As I continue to review movies in October, since it's Halloween month, of course, <laughs> why not review an 80s vampire classic that's now celebrating its 35th anniversary that came out on July 31st, 1987. I'm talking about the movie, The Lost Boys. Yep, which is uh, named after Peter Pan and Neverland stories from J.M. Bari, yeah, which focuses on those boys who were just kids. They never grew up at all. Neither was Peter Pan, and so on. <laughs> because they felt like they just want to become kids. They don't want to be adults at all. They get to do whatever they want. In her life. Well, they decided to use that term for its central theme and element for vampires because they never grew up at all. <laughs> you know, they stay young as an eternal youth and immortality. Well, it's a story about um, a recently divorced mother brought in her two boys as they decided to live and move straight to Santa Carla, California, which is a small beach town. Fictional, by the way. Uh, it, it's really uh, Santa Cruz, California, <laughs> where they live with their eccentric uh, grandfather, which he has his own entire place, you know, made out of wood. And makes all these uh, all these um, wildlife creatures probably stuffed them and all since they're all dead. Anyway, <laughs> so suddenly they got into a run in with um, a group of um, punkish uh, motorcycle gangs who turn out to be vampires. Yeah, and. It's an awesome film. I remember watching this as a kid when it was on HBO. I even remember taping this when it aired in, back in 2008. Uh, but I did watch this back in the 80s and 90s. So I know I remember this being on HBO a lot. And this was awesome. I mean, at, at the time, because this was the same year that Near Dark came out, uh, a little later, which that didn't do very well. But this one, however, became a, a surprisingly hit, um, made over $32 million domestically out of its uh, $8.5 million. Kind of surprise. Um, this was also the beginning of the Corys. Yeah. Corey Haim and Corey Feldman as a duo, because after that they got to do the movie License to Drive, Dream a Little Dream, along with its sequel, National Lampoon's uh, Last Resort, and so on and so forth. But I know Corey Haim has done some movies uh, before and after, and he had been in horror films too, like Stephen King's Silver Bullets, and the Watchers. While Corey Feldman was in one of the Friday the 13th uh, sequels, um, I believe it was the fifth one. Or, yeah, I think it was, yeah, I think it was the fifth one. Um, and also, I know. Corey Feldman went on to do the film Bordello of Blood, the Tales from the Crypt uh, sequel. So that seems like <laughs> what a coincidence, because he got to play a vampire in that film. Yeah, which I know I had Chris Sarandon in that film too from Fright Night. <laughs> what a coincidence. I guess they loved those movies so much that they decided to cast them in, in that film. Okay. Also, Jason Patrick uh, teamed up with Jamie Gertz uh, second time around after their previous film that came out the previous year, 
Solar babies. Mm, it's what it is. And, yeah, I know, and I met Jason Patrick, too. <laughs> He's a cool guy. Um, a long time ago I met him. But this is one of his best performances. And no doubt about it. And also, the beginning of the relationship with uh, the late great director Joe Schumacher. Yeah, the same director, also a writer too. I mean, he, he wrote the screenplay for The Wiz, but he went on to direct movies like, uh, besides this one, uh, he did uh, Flatliners uh, with Kiefer Sullivan. That was their second time that he got to work together. And, um, of course, even work together again with, with the movie uh, Film Booth. But, of course, Joe Schumacher went on to do films like, um, like the, the two Batman movies, uh, Batman Forever and, and that lousy sequel, Batman and Robin. Yeah. And he went on to direct the movie Falling Down with Michael Douglas and directed the, the two of John Grisham's uh, adaptations called The Clients and A Time to Kill come to mind. And, and also he did 8mm, Flawless with Robert De Niro and, and the late great uh, Philip Seymour Hoffman. Yeah. And so he has done a lot of stuff. So it's really cool to see them in, in one movie. And of course, Diane Reist, just after her performance in the movie um, Hannah and Her Sisters by Woody Allen. So it was great to see that. Great to see her in the film. Yeah. Oh, and also, I, I guess you can also say for sure that this was the second movie that both um, Corey Feldman and Kiefer Sullivan were in a movie together after Stand By Me. Yeah. And I know Kiefer Sullivan was in the movie at close range, but he was in a lot of stuff in the 80s, as well as the 90s, too. And that's way before he went on to do the TV series 24, where he played Jack Bayer. Yeah. Yeah, and, and I guess everybody will remember him as Jack Bayer. <laughs> so yes, Jack Bayer was the leader of the gang of the Lost Boys, who are, who is indeed a vampire. Ah, <laughs> uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, originally, it was going to be directed by Richard Donner, but he ends up becoming the executive producer. I think it was because um, he had to work on the movie Lethal Weapon, so that's why he, he couldn't um, he couldn't be couldn't get behind schedule, I guess. So that's why they gave it to Joe Schumacher. Cause they did a great job too. Yeah, they really did. Oh, and also had uh, Alex Winter in the film too, um, who of course went on to play. Bill and the Bill and Ted movies with Keanu Reeves. So you got a great cast to join. Excellent soundtrack, um, including the song Cry Little Sister. You know. Cry little sister, thou shalt not fall. Come, come to your brother, thou shalt not die. Unshame me, sister, thou shalt not fear. Love is with your brother, thou shalt not kill. Yeah, that song. Um, they even have um, the song People Are Strange. I mean, this, this was a cover version of, of the Doors song, you know, Jim Morrison. <laughs> People are strange when they are strange. Face and look ugly out in the rain. People seem wicked when you're strange. 
face and look out of the rain. When you're strange, when you're strange, when you're strange. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's one of the songs. And they got a lot of great songs on, on the soundtrack. It just recently got a, a brand new 4K release. Comes with the Blu ray too. And the brand new 4K restoration. I'm going to pick that up uh, pretty soon. I think I'll pick it up on Black Friday when I get a chance. Because I just watched this movie on the Roku channel. Yes, I did watch it on streaming. Because I know I've watched this movie on HBO as a kid. And I never got tired of that film when I saw it. Because I, I know I remember watching this as a kid when we had cable. And then I later watched it back in the 90s when when we had HBO. But I think I also watched it uh, when, when I was with uh, my father. Um, and I was staying at that hotel at the time. So. But I, I know I did watch this movie a lot. And I did tape it on HBO back in 2008. So. Yeah, I know, full frame, but you get the idea. I, I still have the disc, though. But it does need an upgrade. <laughs> um, no, but I, I would definitely would love to get the 4K release, because it, it just looks excellent. I, I just saw the the movie just recently on the Roku channel, and I'm assuming this is indeed the, the 4K remaster, because I even noticed how excellent the transfer looks. Yes, it has ads on there. Well, what can you do? But it was for free, <laughs> so I got to watch it. But I'm definitely going to get it, and hopefully get to watch all the special features included, and add a digital code on there, and all. so it will be cool. Um, it does have two inferior sequels, um, yeah, of course, all direct to video, which Corey Freeman uh, reprises his role as um, Edgar Fogg, though. yeah. Uh, he also joined in with his brother, um, Alan, played by Jamerson Newlander, on one of them. And yes, this, the sequels suck. No doubt about it. They suck. And I'm not going to bother to review those this year. I mean, one is enough. Um, but if I thought about it, maybe. Um, maybe next year or so. Or maybe just maybe later. <laughs> I don't know. Um, but yeah, they had the tribe and the first. And but there was indeed a comic book series in, in 2008 called Lost Boys Ring of Frogs. So this was supposed to set place, you know, between the two direct to video sequels. But I bet maybe that's what they should have done to make it better. And I think they were going to bring back Kiefer Sutherland to reprise his role, which, which is impossible. Uh, but Schumacher was was planning on doing a sequel originally, but that never happened. Then came to fruition. So I also heard that um, last year uh, they were they were confirmed that they might do a new movie of the Lost Boys. If it's a remake, though. Or it's just going to be another lousy sequel. Forget it. We really don't need this anymore. Okay? I think one's enough. I mean, hey, I'm, I'm glad that at least Near Dark didn't get a sequel. That's never going to happen. Okay. <laughs> well, I'm taking too much of my time, so here we go. Uh, the movie stars Jason Patrick, Corey Haim, no longer with us, of course, but he was great. Kiefer Sullivan, Book McCarter, Billy Worth, who went on to do the movie, which is the remake, by Abel Ferreira, called Body Snatchers. But he's been in other stuff, too. Um, Alex Winter, who later went on to do 
uh, the Bill and Ted movies, of course. Diane Weiss from Hannah and Her Sisters. She was also in the movie Edward Scissorhands. Uh, and also the movie Parenthood. Uh, and I'm talking about the one with Steve Martin and Mary Steenburgen, which later became a series. Uh, Corey Feldman, uh, Jameson Newlander, Jamie Gertz. I know she went on to do another film with Kiefer Sullivan, too, called uh, uh, Renegades, uh, which had Lou Diamond Phillips. And I know both of them were in Young Guns together. Uh, Jamie Gertz uh, would later be in films like um, Civil and Rivalry with Kirstie Alley and A Jersey Girl, not to be confused with the Ben Affleck film. No, she was in a movie with Dylan McDermott. But she was also in the TV series The Neighbors, um, which, interesting enough, I mean, that was an ABC series that came out a decade ago. Which um, one of my friends um, at Inclusion Films um, actually got to be in an extra and actually work on as part of the crew. So I thought that was really cool because I did watch the series uh, when it was on ABC, uh, mostly because I was watching Modern Family at the time <laughs> in the middle, too. Yeah, but it was mostly Modern Family I watched. Um, oh yeah, and also Don't Trust to Be in Part 20. Yeah, I remember those shows. I can't believe that was 10 years ago, too. So long ago. Uh, Edward Herman, who's no longer with us, but yes, he's been in films like Richie Rich and Overboard, which came out the same year as this film. Um, and I know he was, um, well, the last movie he was in, before he past was um, The Town That Drenched Sundown, which was a, a meta-sequel, not a remake, because they did play the, the original movie at a local drive-in, which is a very underrated movie. Yeah, I can't believe it got a 5.6 on IMDb. You gotta be kidding me. Another reason not to trust IMDb sometimes. Uh, Bernard Hughes... Chance Michael Corbett, Alexander Bacon, or Bacon, uh, Chapman, Nori Morgan, Kelly Joel Minter, who was in the movie Mask uh, from 1985, not to be confused with The Mask with Jim Carrey. Now, this was the one with uh, Eric Stoltz, Cher, and Sam Elliott, uh, which was based on a true story. And she was also in Summer School from 1987 with Mark Carmen and Kirstie Alley. And Tim uh, Capello. It's written by Janice Fisher, Jeffrey Bohm. Yes, Jeffrey Bohm, no longer with us, but he went on to write screenplays for films like The Dead Zone with uh, Christopher Walken, and based on the Stephen King novel, uh, which I know they had a TV series. Uh, uh, Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade, Inner Space, as well as um, the Lethal Weapon sequels, 2 and 3. Yeah, and he also worked on the, the TV show uh, The Adventures of Briscoe County Jr., the short-lived series with Bruce Campbell. I love that show, but I gotta get that DV. <laughs> yeah, I really do. I wish they put it on Blu-ray, though. That would be nice. I know they have it on streaming, too. Like, you can watch it on Tubi. And it's directed by Joe Schumacher. The movie begins set in a small, fictionalized beach town called Santa Carla, California, murder capital of the world, as it was written in graffiti on the back of a giant billboard that says, Welcome to Santa Carla, by a bunch of punk teenagers, you know, doing all these illegal activity with their spray cans and all. Well, you get the idea. It's really Santa Cruz, California. That's home of the Santa Cruz Beach Boardwalk that's located on the pier near the beach where it has all these amusement rides such as the roller coasters, the Ferris wheel, the carousel, 
you know, they had like the trampolines and all these other games that they got. So they win prizes. They have all these shops and restaurants included where all the kids, teenagers, and adults would hang around day and night. <laughs> Especially when we meet this mysterious young motorcycle gang, very punkish. That's run by their leader, David Powers, played by Kiefer Sullivan, along with Markle Thompson, played by Alex Winter, Dwayne Stevens, played by Billy Worth, and Paul Harris, played by Book McCarter. They also have a beautiful girl named Star, played by Jamie Gertz, um, along with uh, a young boy named Laddie, played by Chance Michael Corbett. Anyway, they hang around harassing all the patrons at the carousel where they're being thrown out by a local security guard so now they've been suspended and then afterwards um, when the boardwalk was closed the security guard was in in his car who suddenly had been attacked by the entire gang that turned out to be vampires yeah they're flying around at night and taking out their victims, you know, sucking their blood or ripping their bodies to shreds completely. So yes, he totally vanished along with the rest of the other teenagers in certain scenes here and there. Um, the next day, we meet the Emerson family. Their mother, Lucy, played by Diane Weiss, who's been recently divorced by her husband, joined by her two sons, um, one is an older teenager named Michael, played by Jason Patrick, along with his younger brother Sam, played by Corey Haim. And they decided to move and live in with their eccentric father, who happens to be Michael and Sam's grandfather, simply Grandpa. Um, they never revealed his real name, but you kind of get the idea. But he's basically a hippie type. You know, he goes around, you know, building his entire place out of all these wooden logs. And he brings in all these mystical uh, wildlife creatures that he stuffed and just sent it directly to decorate his entire place. Sends it to everyone's rooms here and there. He even comes up with his own rules, too. Especially at the refrigerator where he puts in this one stack that says, Old Fart. And that's where he puts his uh, his root beer, Pyre's root beer, and his cookies and stuff. It's his own food. Uh, the rest is just for them to, to dig through. <laughs> yeah. So now they have all their rooms to stay in. They don't have a TV. They do have a stereo, though. And they have other stuff. They have beds and bathrooms and all that. They even have a dog, too. Um, a husky dog. So really cool. <laughs> anyway, as soon went on, Lucy just got a job working at a local video store at the boardwalk that's being owned by a bachelor named Max Lawrence, who's played by Edward Tuman, who may seem rather suspicious, but he does seem to act pretty normal at times. Because, um, well, he does act like, like an adult, or responsible, even try to tell these kids to get out. You know, they keep making all these rackets. Anyway, then uh, Michael became fascinated with Star, as she hangs around at the boardwalk, especially at night, only to find out that she was actually with uh, David and his gang. So, there you go. And then, and then next, at the local comic book store, Sam eventually meets uh, the Frog Brothers, Edgar and Alan Frog, both played by Corey Feldman and Jameson Newlander. Uh, Edgar eventually sounds more Dr. Von Drake Ian's when it comes to his deeper voice. I mean, he was hitting puberty, by the way, because he's a teenager. It turns out that they were a pair of self-proclaimed vampire hunters because they begin to hear that that a bunch of vampires are warming around 
the entire town attacking these victims. So they teach Sam how to read all these horror comics to be able to learn for sure that he'll, he'll soon, if he ever spots a vampire, he'll be able to kill them right away. And he'll probably join in with the brothers too to teach him how to use, you know, the wooden stake, the long bowl, the water guns, you know, with holy water and all that stuff. <laughs> so, yeah. Oh, yeah, and garlic, too. <laughs> okay. So, during that night, uh, Michael is joined in with Star, along with David and his gang, as they're teaching him to be part of it by challenging to do all these several tests that they had to do, such as you know, going on a race, you know, with their motorcycles, you know, to go all the way straight into the cliff. So, Michael almost died at that point. And then they went straight down into the cliff, where it turns out to be an abandoned hotel, a very luxury hotel that's been destroyed by... An earthquake that happened in 1906 so now it just looks like a cave and that's indeed where it looked like already all tattered up and and all so they just hang around yeah they have their own beds and all this stuff too all the well we do learn that they actually slept upside down through those caves um yeah David was like teasing the uh, Michael while they were having Chinese food that Markle just brought up in a Coca-Cola box where it had maggots and worms but it, which is really rice and, and chow mein yeah just just manipulating him and all and then next thing you know they bought in a bottle all fabricated um, it's a green bottle it looked like uh, red wine but in reality it's blood Star warns them not to drink it, but it was too late. So after that, they went on to do some more tasks, including hanging around on this local bridge, yeah, where the train is about to head off. Yeah, it's a werewolf uh, bridge. So they, so the whole game were hanging around, and then later they fell down into this foggy river, and then soon. Michael had developed some several changes with himself. Yes, um, it, they, um, at this rate, he, begin, he begins to find out that he's been oversleeping throughout the day and night. His eyes have been sensitive to sunlight. The smell of food revolves him because he was trying to get a drink of, of milk from the carton, but he dropped it by accident. Made a mess out of himself. He just left the the refrigerator door open, and it turns out that you know he was hungry for blood, and he even started flying around outside, all floating, and he was almost ready to to kill Sam while he was taking a bath, joining with his dog, and then the dog eventually attacked Michael. He thought maybe Michael attacked the dog killed him but thank goodness that didn't happen he actually attacked uh, Michaels by biting his hand yeah so he had a cut on his hand because the dog was protecting him so he began to find out what's going on because he noticed that his reflection has been partly transparent in the mirror so Sam became initially terrified so much that he had decided to call Lucy, their mom, right away while she was on a date with Max at a local restaurant. So it causes her to, to miss out on, but they'll make it up for it. Which Max uh, eventually was went back home with his dog and, of course, spotted all of the entire game, you know, flying around as vampires, you know, just teasing him and putting all these tricks. They just threw a a uh, a bat uh, 
kite on the side. And it looked like, you know, there's going to be something suspicious going around, too, about him. Well, to make matters worse, I mean, things got a little intense, too, because Mike, Sam was just wearing his robe filled with garlic because he just called uh, his brothers, Edgar and Alan, finding out that his brother's a vampire. But he's not yet a vampire. He, he eventually is just starting to change at this point in time. So the other day, uh, just when um, Lucy was going to go back to Max's uh, house, he soon was almost being attacked by Max's dog. Yeah, I mean, he got really furious and ferocious and all. Like, like he got rabies or something. So at that rate, Sam became suspicious to find out that maybe Max might be the head vampire as we speak. Well, I don't know. So, to make it up for that, um, Lucy decided to invite Max for, for dinner at the house, but both Sam and along with uh, Edgar and Alan just came by I know, they, they threw in this joke, Edgar Allan Poe, I guess. Think about that. <laughs> um, anyway, they, they claimed that, that Max might be the head vampire because they had to go around, you know, putting garlic uh, on the cheese while they were having spaghetti. And then soon they were going to turn off the lights and they wanted to make sure they see his reflections or or try to pour some water to make sure but it turns out he was just normal and he apologized for that <laughs> uh, well Michael just already left to yeah he told him you're invited so he just went back to hang around with the game to see what they're doing next and yes indeed they're going around attacking more victims around so they're running them uh, Star eventually appeared um, just to warn uh, Michael that they're going to come after you and, and soon they're going to have another attack that's going to happen pretty soon. So for its own preparement though, uh, they went back straight to the cave where they hang around. They had to prepare themselves by bringing in the holy water filled water guns along with the longbow and wood stakes that they all made. Joining with Michael and Star, uh, Sam, Edgar, and Alan, they drove off. You know, They just took uh, their grandfather's uh, convertible, blue convertible, straight over there, and, and, and they're trying to find the entire gang as they're already sleeping upside down. They just killed uh, Marco, stabbing them with the wooden stake. Yeah, I mean, it was... It was Edgar who stabbed them. Uh, just when they already took um, their kid Laddie, who was hanging around, so that way they can take him back to their house to protect themselves. So since they just killed one, um, the others were about to attack them, including uh, David. So now they prepare themselves for this one big night. Uh, they got everything all prepared. They had to throw in some garlic and holy water onto the tub. And they had to put all this other stuff that they have. They had to block everything. They had to barricade everything so to make sure. They just forgot the dog. So they took the dog and put him inside the, the house right away. Soon, um, David, Paul, and Dwayne had came by and were ready to attack them all the way. Laddie eventually transformed into the vampire. Star didn't, unfortunately, but there, <laughs> which is funny because they almost, yeah, there was a um, the monsters joke in the movie. Oh, it's the return of Eddie Munster. <laughs> anyway, uh, the scene where Edgar and Alan uh, were ready to stab uh, one of them, and they just uh, eventually went straight into the bathroom. Um, luckily, the dog saved saved their lives because 
they were re they were going to uh, take out the garlic and with holy water and just splashes on this guy's face and it, it was already burning him and then next thing you know the dog just pushes him straight into the tub and it causes the the entire bathroom to become a wreckage yeah the toilet seats were and and the sinks even in the kitchen sink was was getting destroyed all filled with blood all around as it just killed this one vampire and he turned into like a, a skeleton <laughs> it was crazy and very insane but then there's another scene and this is my favorite too uh, was when Sam uh, took out the um, the, uh, the long bow because this one vampire just just grab him and flew him around and and just knocked him around and while well, Michael was over there trying to stop him next thing you know um, he used the longbow and, and shot him but he missed and he yeah the vampire says ha 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 you miss sucker and then Sam says only once pal and then he shot the bow straight at him for sure and it then went straight into the stereo <laughs> where they were playing some heavy metal music. And then he says the line, Death by stereo. <laughs> so now they're trying to, to save Star and Laddie for sure. But then Michael has to face uh, David as he kept flying around, attacking him. And now that's where they started fighting off, battling each other. And then, then uh, Michael just sends uh, David straight into the back uh, room where it has all these uh, moose, all these uh, deer and moose hooves around, and just and he got stabbed. And yeah, he died. Well, the other two vampires, as we all know, had already exploded and, and all. <laughs> but he's he's like the only one who doesn't explode and and turn into a skeleton. No, he just eventually turned normal as he transforms back to into himself. Because you know, all all the entire game transforms into vampires for sure to know what they look like. And then we get to see the final twist once uh, Lucy and Max had came by. And then that's where we begin to find out what really happened for sure. And then all of a sudden, and this is a big surprise when we find out that, and yes, even Sam knew it all this time, that Max Lawrence is indeed the head vampire. Because they begin to find out that Michael's powers has a transborn hasn't transport back to his own self so that's why he warned Sam not to look at him because that's why Star was telling him that it's not ready yet for sure so now as Max has been revealed he explains that he instructed David to turn Sam and Michael into vampires so that Lucy could not refuse to be transformed herself to make themselves the entire family of vampires. Just as Max was ready to pull Lucy together. And yeah, he was ready to, to bite her neck. And what came to the rescue was her father. Yep. And he, he just drove us straight into the entire house which one of the fences <clears throat> actually stabs him completely and went and he actually went straight into the the firehouse yeah went straight into the firewood where the fireplace and that's where he he burned completely so now he's max is finally gone and the whole thing is over so Michael is finally back to normal. So is so is Laddie, Star, and, 
and everyone so now they're they're not gonna be vampires anymore thank goodness and that's where we had this one line one special closing line that you'll never forget and I love that line right there was when grandpa just went straight to the kitchen opened up the, the refrigerator door and he just grabbed a nice cold hires root beer and he says one thing about living in Santa Carla I could never stomach all the damn vampires oh. yes so true grandpa so true because these vampires are one big totally blood-sucking assholes <laughs> for sure yeah uh, I love this movie and I always have ever since I was a kid um, it's definitely indeed a horror comedy so it's not just an ordinary supernatural horror movie as they claim but it definitely is had a lot of comedy elements a lot of memorable dialogue and all of that around and an excellent cast to be remembered by all of which had went on to become you know famous too a very solid writing coming from free writers uh, Janice Fisher James Jeremias and indeed Jeffrey Bohm so if it wasn't for them they would never have a bigger hit on their hands think about that but wow just amazing they has wonderful incredible special effects that they use some luscious camera angles I mean they had some some zoom in close-ups here and there um, even all these flying sequences that they show they, they even show the, the clouds too and they show how the camera just moves around forward the, all the way like round on the left and right sides you know it's just it's like going all over places all in circles around you know they must have used some really special um, dolly shots they added for this film because there's like there's numerous uh, dolly shots in this movie all the way around it really gives you this more um, dark uh, vampire feel into for a movie like this I mean it, it gives you a horror vibe when it comes to these shots they, they use it just it's incredible and that's how you do movies like that when when it comes to it so I guess this is the kind of style that Joe Schumacher eventually borrowed from other films that he did later in in his career I mean and that's probably how he used that in in the, the Batman movies and all, all the insane scenes that they had I mean all these crazy goofy scenes but it's just incredible I, I love it so much and again it has an excellent soundtrack I already mentioned it already um, I love the cast as I already mentioned too I mean Kiefer Sullivan definitely nails his performance as David Powers I mean no matter no matter how many roles he's done in his career he's terrific as when he plays villains too he really is and this really shows that he can definitely play an excellent villain but he can also play heroes too yeah he can do he's pretty much like Sean Penn I mean he, he's um, a versatile actor uh, Jason Patrick is terrific as Michael really shows that he can really play a very cool and awesome vampire I mean he should be the good guy and and he is the good guy but you know how he felt when he had end up making that one mistake but that's okay it's just part of the experience he never thought he would have I mean like Corey Haim is awesome as Sam I mean you really felt for him but but also the fact that he joins with the Frog Brothers, Edgar and Allen. I mean, two awesome guys too. Together, it's like you, know, you can actually have them as as the vampire hunters. <laughs> yeah. 
Um, Diane Reese is cute as Lucy. Uh, the grandfather, you know, Bernard Hughes, you know, he was terrific. I mean, he was awesome, too. Excellent. I mean, as eccentric as he can be, I mean, and smart and intelligent and crazy and weird and, and all, I mean, I think he's just a badass guy. Um, uh, Jamie Gertz is beautiful as star. And uh, Alice Winter, you know, it's great to see him before he went on to do Bill and Ted. So now you know how, how punky he could be along with the rest. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so they must have took a lot of time to shoot this. But that's why this movie is just so awesome. Uh, it, also, it, it turns out that... Um, not only did they shot the film in in the Santa uh, Cruz, they actually shot the most of these scenes at Santa Clarita, um, which is near Magic Mountain. I mean, I think maybe some of the scenes were at Magic Mountain because they had a, a roller coaster themselves and other places too, other rides that they got. So, so you might be able to see a little bit of that too, and then. And they shot the cliffside uh, at the Pelos of Birders uh, Peninsula. So, yeah, they, they shot several scenes here and there in those particular spots to make it look like they shot at this particular small beach town. Um, I also learned that um, Kiefer actually broke his wrist uh, doing his... Uh, really stunts uh, on a motorcycle so it turns out he had to wear gloves uh, for that reason uh, yeah they had a lot of cool uh, stunts that they used when they were doing the the motorcycle scenes uh, when they're racing together they're challenging they they had to do all these other kinds when they're trying to go straight through the cliffs um, and they had a, a lot of incredible special effects that they use you know with the blood and gore scenes of bodies ripping apart and attacking uh, the flying sequences and the and the makeup effects they use for the transformation of the characters as vampires you know the these eyes the teeth <clears throat> the, the teeth and all i mean incredibly vicious and scary <sighs> really incredible so. <laughs> Yeah. And they only shot this um, for 21 days. Can you believe that? 21 days. That's amazing. That's like a month. Like like a half a month. Perfect. But I'm sure maybe they took two months or so. Anyway. Awesome movie. No doubt about it. Um, it is like Peter Pan, but for vampires. <laughs> and it's very dark. And it's R-rated, too. So it has some foul language in there, here and there. So, so there's no way this a film like this could be PG-14 or PG-rated. But I'm sure kids can see this movie for sure. They just got to warn them about all these uh, graphic scenes. Yeah, anyway. <laughs> or any other tense moments here and there. Glad this movie became a huge hit, you know. We're seeing the over 32 million domestically, which would have made even more in inflation costs. I think it would have been going up to like maybe over 100 or so. Maybe even 200 from today. I mean, it depends on it. Um, <clears throat> out of its uh, $8.5 million. Perfect. And I think it was because Robocop came out at number one. And that's why this one opened at number two. Yeah. Well, Superman uh, 4 eventually flopped. Yeah. And so was Masters of the Universe that summer. Not to mention, um, this was the same year where not only we got Near Dark, but we also got uh, The Monster Squad. Because that came out that summer, too, after The Lost Boys. So, talk about... 
one particular monster year. <laughs> okay, anyway, that's The Lost Boys, and I give the movie five stars. I'm Joseph A. Sabora, and I'll see you later. Bye.